Good evening. Welcome to the Wallace Genetic Lecture on the usual suspects, resurgence, resilience, and regeneration in the face of climate change. I'm Keith Gillis, I'm Dean of the College of Natural Resources, um, and I'd like to start by thanking the Wallace Genetic Foundation for their support for this event. Uh, we wouldn't be here without it. There is a bit of a budget problem in the university right now. Um, I have to say it was really delightful to meet with Joan Murray, the granddaughter of Henry Wallace, who's one of the more interesting figures in American history, if you follow American agricultural history. Um, she was enthusiastic about this proposal from the first moment. We talked with her about it. and. Uh, one week after I pitched this, this, this event and the idea to her, uh, I was in Costa Rica and ran into two portraits of her grandfather at uh, Katia Rica uh, and realized, boy, the, the scope of this fellow's uh, career was really broad. Um, and uh, his interest in the role of agriculture and its, its uh, place in international development was really quite, quite extraordinary. Um, I'd also like to thank the faculty and students of the Division of Society and the Environment uh, in ESPM, the best division in the department. <laughs> My division. <laughs> uh, for the energy, creativity, hard work that they put in to try and uh, shape this evening's uh, event and tomorrow's workshop. And I'd also like to thank Javiera, one of our graduate students, and we're <laughs> And the finder, um, who worked really tirelessly on this, this event. Um, and now to my, my real job this evening, for which I put on a tie, as, as deans will do when they have really important tasks, uh, I'd like to introduce one of our young faculty stars, Carolyn Fenney. <laughs> um, Carolyn's going to have the honor this evening of introducing our panel of distinguished speechers, which of course means that she's actually more important than I am because I like um, and <laughs> that's right. That probably means we should change paychecks, right? Yeah. Um, go for it. <laughs> um, Carolyn uh, is in the Division of Society and Environment. Her research is very interesting. Uh, she's worked in Nepal. She's worked in the United States. I think she would have worked more in Nepal if events had transpired differently, uh, but probably. Um, but she, the, the problems with carrying out some of her work in Nepal has been to our benefit domestically. Um, she's done some fabulous work recently on African American participation in environmental debates and decision making. Um, she came to us after earning her PhD in geography from Clark University. Geography. geography. <laughs> I actually, my first paper was economic geography, so I, I can claim some allegiance there. Um, Carolyn's uh, work looks at how issues of difference impact participation in decision making in environmental processes. Um, she's looking at ways to develop cultural competency within environmental organizations and institutions, challenging media outlets in terms of their mis- or non-representation of the different folks, and working to try and increase awareness of how privilege shapes those who get to speak and have standing to speak on environmental issues as that affects policy. Carolyn, the podium is yours, and welcome. Thank you. This is, uh, I shouldn't say awesome, that's such a Berkeley thing. <laughs> but it's really great to be here and it's great to have this panel, which I love, which I will talk a little bit about. Um, first of all, I also just want to doubly thank the people that made this really possible. And for me, it's always the people working behind the scenes. So Javiera, Catherine, uh, Myra, there's a bunch of people who did a lot of work to get us all here today. And so I want to give them another hand. <laughs> And now I want to introduce this fabulous panel. Uh, the beauty of being the person who gets to do the introductions, you get to decide what it is you want to say about the people. Um, first, I would like to, well, wait, before I do that, I should tell you all 
how this is going to work, the program, because people often like to know how, it's, how we're going to do this thing. So what's going to happen, I'm going to introduce everybody. Um, each of our panelists are going to have about 10 minutes to get up and do their thing for you, provide some context. Uh, I, uh, a lot of us have been asking each other for questions, you know, students, faculty, any things that we'd like to put to the panelists for them to answer. Uh, we will do that. We have a lot of questions. I won't be able to get to everybody, but I really appreciate everybody's input. Then we're going to open it up to the audience as well, because we'd really like this to be some kind of dialogue. And I think this is a great opportunity, because we have three really wonderful people here today. OK. So first, I'd like to introduce Will Allen. Uh, Mr. Allen has come from humble beginnings. I like to talk a little bit about where people came from, because I think it's really important to see where they've been and how they got to where they are. His mother worked as a housekeeper, and his father was a former sharecropper. Um, he was an urban farmer. Um, he is an urban farmer now and is a retired American basketball player. But he grew up in Rockville, Maryland before he got there with his parents and siblings. And I believe your family, his family also had a farm. Is that correct? So farming's kind of been in your blood for a really long time. After uh, playing some basketball over in Belgium for a while, he came back. He got a BA uh, from the University of Miami. He uh, worked for a number of years in corporate marketing at Procter & Gamble, but then he decided to return to his roots as a farmer. Uh, when he quit um, Procter & Gamble, he received a severance package, and with it, he went out and bought a tractor and 100 acres um, in order to raise his three kids with his wife in 1995. And so in 1995, he started the organization that many of us have heard him talk about, which is, and we will hear him talk about today, it's known as Growing, Growing Power. He is the director and the founder of Growing Power, which produces um, vast amounts of food year-round at its main farming site two acres of land located within Milwaukee city limits. Um, he uses innovative farming methods and educational programs. And for him, it's not so much about embracing the back to the land approach that a lot of us talk about. Um, but he is really uh, talking about um, taking more of a holistic uh, farming approach, and he incorporates both um, cultivating foodstuffs and designing food distribution networks in urban settings. Uh, and he has won a lot of awards. The one I want to draw attention to is the MacArthur Genius Award, first black farmer to win the MacArthur Genius Award, <laughs> which I think is fabulous. Um, our next speaker is Jihan Giron. Uh, did I say that right? I did, all right. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know, you didn't say that very convincingly. Okay. Uh, Jihan Giron, Ms. Giron is a Diné and African American. Uh, Jihan's family is from the community of, of Old Sawmill, Old Sawmill, excuse me. And she grew up and went to high school um, close by in Fort Defiance, located in the eastern part of the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. She is also a graduate. Now, when I say this, if people hiss, it's not because, okay, because it's just because how they, how, this is the way they are here in Berkeley. She is a graduate of Stanford University. <laughs> Sorry with a Bachelor's of Science in Earth Systems and a f with a focus in energy science and technology. She is an aggressive advocate, I like that, I looked that up and somebody said, you are an aggressive advocate, I like it, of indigenous people's rights and environmental justice. She is an active organizer, speaker, and writer on indigenous peoples and environmental justice, energy, climate change, and climate justice. In her position as Native Energy Organizer at the Indigenous Environmental, Net Environmental Network, Jihan works to build the capacity of communities throughout the U.S. and Canada who, who are impacted by energy development and climate change. Did I do good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and finally, but last but not least, is Mr. Michael Galopter. Michael is originally from New York. We have that in common. Um, he's one of the country's leading climate strategists. He's worked for more than 25 years as a regulator, a policymaker, a researcher, and thought leader on environmental and social policy. Uh, it's important to also know that he got his BA, his MS, and his PhD from Berkeley. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and it was for CNR. That's right. Yeah, right, right, right. Energ, energy and resources. Um, 
Most recently, Michael was president of Redefining Progress, the United States' leading domestic sustainability and policy institute. Uh, Michael's list is really long. I was looking and I said, man, this is heavily impressive, so I want to throw a few things out to you. Um, it's true. He serves as a member of the Clinton Global Initiative, the advisory board of Vice President Al Gore's Alliance for Climate Protection, and the boards of the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Environmental Leadership Program, the Center for Race and Poverty and the Environment, and the list goes on and on. He's founded and directed the Environmental Policy Program at Columbia University. He's worked as a Congressional Black Caucus Fellow and for the U.S. House of Rep Representatives Energy and Commerce Committee with Director of Environmental Quality, excuse me, and also was Director of Environmental Quality for the City of New York and served as an Assistant Commissioner for its Department of Environmental Protection. Michael's done a lot, and you all should know he lives here, so we've got him here, so there's no excuse for you not to take advantage of his presence here on a, a daily basis. So that's our three speakers. Now we're going to give them each about 10 minutes. Catherine here is going to be keeping time, so pay attention, <laughs> and to talk, to talk to us a little bit about who you are, anything, what you do, anything you want to set the context for the rest of us. And first up, I believe we have is Ms. Giron. <laughs> That's right. Don't worry, I won't get up here and start cheering about Stanford. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. I also want to give a shout out to Javiera, who's been planning this since the beginning of this year. And thank you very much for putting us together. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here and listening. I hope that I can say something interesting uh, to help get a good discussion going. So um, like was said, I work with the Indigenous Environmental Network. And IEN is a network of indigenous peoples empowering indigenous nations and communities towards sustainable livelihoods, um, demanding environmental justice, and maintaining the sacred fire of our traditions. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about the place that I come from. Um, so I grew up on the reservation in Arizona. Has anybody been that way? Yay! Okay, <laughs> some people have been that way. Um, you've probably seen it a lot in car commercials or, you know, music videos, Monument Valley. It's a really beautiful place. Um, <clears throat> it's the largest reservation, 26,000 square miles. It's about the size of West Virginia um, in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Um, we're the largest tribe, 300,000 members. Um, about half on, half off of the reservation. Um, we're farmers and ranchers. You know, we grow corn and squash, beans, and people have sheep. You know, it's a big sheep culture as well as horses and cattle. Um, and we're pretty good at practicing our religion. A lot of people speak our language. Um, we still carry our traditional practices. And there's other people in there too as well, like Native American church. We have Mormons, Catholics, Christians, you know, we're a good mix of people. Um, we also, uh, about 32% of us don't have running water on our reservation. 38% of us don't have electricity. So 75% of US homes without electricity are on our reservation. Um, we have 56% of our people live below the poverty level, is what they tell us. 54% uh, of people are unemployed, and the average income of a person on our reservation is $7,000 a year. Um, I tell you all this because we're talking about resilience. And I'll tell you that we're a community who knows how to be resilient and knows how to take care of ourselves um, because this is a situation that we're in. Unfortunately, we're also in a situation of being what they call batteries for larger cities, especially in the Southwest. So our main sources of income for our tribe are from coal royalties, as well as oil and gas development and uranium development on our reservation, several coal-fired power plants on our reservation. Um, and all of these things are to provide for the larger cities like Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, and Flagstaff, where I live um, in Arizona. <clears throat> We, uh, and because of that, you know, coupling the situation that we live in, the kind of people that we are, uh, coupling that with, 
you know, the resources that are being taken out of our lands to provide for other cities, I think um, you could associate a lot of negative impacts on our people because of those things. We have um, contaminated land, contaminated air, contaminated water, um, and a lot of wasted water. Um, we have a lot of health problems in our communities, especially around those areas where there are like three coal-fired power plants within a 20-mile radius or where there's been a long history of uranium mining that's never been cleaned up, just a foot of dirt put over on top of all the mill tailings. So there's a lot of people that are sick on our reservation because of this. And we're also in a situation that we don't have to get into, but it started way back in 1492, um, a situation of being <coughs> being stuck in these gridlocked economies where coal, oil, gas, uranium are what people see as our only ways of surviving in this world, right? Um, it's a really weird situation to be in, and I think because on the one hand, we're really trying to be who we are and live our way of life and be traditional people. On the other hand, we're trying to survive in this economic system that is surrounding us everywhere. And unfortunately, I think what that really boils down to is that these two don't go together for us. You know, we, in order for us to go ahead and say, yeah, it's okay, let's just dig up all this area, blast it, this mesa here that actually has very significant meaning in our culture in order for us to like kick out our own members out of this area in order for us to waste this water. Um, we're really selling out our own culture when we participate in these kind of things. And it's partly our fault, but it's partly not our fault. It's a long history of this process called colonization. And that's the situation of many indigenous communities in the US and Canada and all around the world. And these are the communities that we work with at IEN. Um, when we're talking about resilience, something that has really been in the forefront of my mind these past few weeks is the issue of water in the Southwest. Um, it's a desert, right? <laughs> and our tribe, the Navajo Nation government has to make a decision, is planning on making a decision, I think the last date I heard was the 25th of this month, of whether or not to settle on a water agreement with Northern Arizona that would cover the whole lower Colorado River Basin. And, you know, a lot of us, <clears throat> when we first heard about this, because it wasn't public knowledge, and we brought a big group and went to our capital in Windy Rock and did a lot of protesting and we printed these shirts that I'm wearing now. We were opposed to our tribe signing on to this water settlement agreement. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the exact numbers, but one of the main things is that they're trying to give us 31,000 acre feet of water out of a main source in the lower Colorado River Basin. Um, forever. In the negotiation and agreement, it says forever. And um, the Navajo Generating Station, which is a coal-fired power plant um, that pumps the water uh, through the large canal down to Phoenix and Tucson from, with coal from our reservation, um, it operates on 25,000 acre feet of water a year. And so our whole part of that reservation is only supposed to be 30, get 31,000 acre feet of water a year forever. And they tell us, you know, I went and talked with a lawyer, Stanley Pollock, who's a lawyer of our Navajo Nation, for our Navajo Nation since 1985. So he's been working on this since 1985, and this is the best that he could come up with, right? Is, well, this is the best you're going to get, you know. We live in a state where if you can't prove that you're going to use this water, then you can't have it. And so that means that we live in a place, in a state, and I actually would say in a country and a world where you are not rewarded for being resilient and you are not rewarded for being sustainable. You're actually rewarded for being wasteful. And having pools and fountains and golf courses in the middle of a desert, you're rewarded for that. And <clears throat> But he tells us that this is the best we're going to get. If we try and litigate, um, you know, we're going to get pushed up into the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court is not going to side with us as a Navajo Nation. That's what they tell us. So, you know, we're stuck in a rock and a hard place um, around this issue of water. And uh, so, anyway, this is something that has been at the forefront of my thoughts that I think is important to the context of this because I think when we talk about resilience, um, there's like two key parts. It's like your ability, 
for your own self personally or your own family or your own community to be able to take care of yourself without taking from other places. That's one part of it. And the second part of it is what is your ability to actually do that? You know, and I put a check mark for us as Navajo people on that first point that I mentioned. But the second part of it is, what if someone is constantly trying to take from you <laughs> and constantly taking all of your resources from you, you know, how resilient can you be, you know, if that's the situation that you're in? And it's a different situation I feel that I'm in than the majority of you in here are in, but I think it's still, it's important for you know not so not to know not so that you like feel sorry for us or not so that you you know I'm pulling on your tugging on your heartstrings although you would be heartless if your heartstrings aren't being pulled. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's because I think you also have a role to play in this. Um, uh, I think I'll share with you. Um, these uh, four, it's called Four Principles for Climate Justice that um, our organization developed. And we've been very involved in the international climate negotiations for several years. And so this is um, in that context, but I also think that it's very um, applicable to what's happening on our reservation and also applicable on all different kinds of levels. So these four principles, and I won't, they're pretty self-explanatory, is one is <coughs> leave fossil fuels in the ground. So this is around climate change. So this means, okay, we realize you're trying to offset, build a forest down here that supposedly takes in carbon dioxide, which it actually has not proven to actually do that, and that can't be quantified. But the most important thing you could do is to stop using fossil fuels, right? That's the whole point of this. The second is to demand real and effective solutions. So this means, you know, stop promoting these things like clean coal. As a, as a solution to climate change, or nuclear power as a solution to climate change, or the carbon market, or carbon offsets, or geoengineering. I'm sure all of you guys know what all of these things are as solutions to climate change, because they don't actually get to the real problem of what's going on. They're just surface, band-aids, right? The third is um, developed countries take responsibility. You guys under all understand what that's about, right? It's because we're the ones who are using everything. And then the last, and I think the most important, is living in a good way on Mother Earth, which if any of you guys have been following um, the climate talks, uh, you might understand as um, Buen Vivir, the idea of Buen Vivir that's coming out of Bolivia in particular, the idea of learning how to actually live in a way that's good and respectful and logical, actually. And these are all on the kind of larger scale of things, but I think they're totally applicable even to what I'm saying, you know, that if people learned how to change their way of life, we wouldn't be in a situation that we're in as Navajo people or as indigenous people. Um, so I think, and a lot of people ask me, well, what's the alternative, you know? How are you supposed to solve the problem? And it's gonna be too hard to stop using fossil fuels and this and that. But I honestly don't feel that it's that hard. <laughs> I mean, I understand the complications in it, but I feel like it takes just kind of an individual effort to stop being such a wasteful person, and that's even including me. And so in setting the context for the larger discussion that's happening later on and tomorrow, I just want to think, want you to think about how our situation in indigenous peoples and how those four principles that I laid out are applicable to you. How are they, how can you use them, but more importantly, how will you use them in the work that you're doing here in this university to become leaders in this area of work? And I kind of will just leave it to you as a question, I guess, because I'm out of time. So thank you. Here's a start, uh, still popping, so if, uh, you know. Uh, but I'm glad it's this informal 
kind of atmosphere here tonight. So uh, uh, what I'm going to uh, do, because our work, I've been doing this work for a long time, and uh, we've accumulated a lot of things and tried to figure out a lot of things over a lot of years. And uh, a great deal of my work today is really about uh, bringing uh, uh, many stakeholders to the, what I call a good food uh, table. Because uh, I think we need everybody at the table. Uh, and we just had a recent uh, conference in Milwaukee uh, that was very uh, diverse in terms of uh, the types of uh, tracks we had. At, at, I, it wasn't really a conference, it was really a gathering. Uh, because it was at uh, our state fair uh, in Milwaukee and we're able to have an kind of the environment that really uh, brought out a lot of uh, uh, good stuff. Uh, but we had folks from the medical community, we had folks from, uh, uh, I think that's the, the end yeah. instead of the beginning. I'm sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think the best way for me to uh, really uh, kind of show you some of the work that we do is to show you a few images if we're able to. Um, yeah, there we are. And Javier is going to be my clicker here because of the technology problem we have. So I will do the best we can. Uh, actually, what you're about to see is about 600 slides <laughs> in 10 minutes, OK? Uh, and Michael's. Michael Pollan over here, seen them before, so, uh, but there's some new ones in there too. It's actually more than the last time. Uh, so, yeah, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, keep, yeah, just, just roll it. Uh, this is the early years. I purchased the last remaining farm in Milwaukee in 1993, and this is what it looked like in those days. And these were some of the kids that uh, I work with. They're over 30 years old now. Uh, and this was some of our early attempts at uh, composting, because if you're going to do urban agriculture composting, you can keep rolling, um, is uh, uh, one of the, the second most important thing, I think, in terms of uh, being able to get food to folks. Uh, because my feeling is that, you can keep rolling, um, is that uh, uh, these are the greenhouses that were built in the late 1920s. This is a 19th century farm. Um, and we do, uh, uh, these, were, these were some of the original kids back in those days in the community. Uh, and, and part of the work that I do is really about engaging communities is the first thing. If you're not able to do that, just from a social justice standpoint, if you're not able to get the community involved, then you can't really move forward. So that's where I sp I've spent a lot of my time and it takes a long time to be able to engage community. Uh, and then we started doing aquaponics on a small scale like this, and you'll see how uh, this facility has changed. Uh, we do research, uh, education, and uh, uh, pretty large scale production. Back in those days, we grew a lot of bedding plants because that's the type of greenhouse it was. And we were able to uh, use those plants to uh, pretty much decorate the city of Milwaukee in some of the more <coughs> stressed neighborhoods. Uh, and I work with a lot of young kids and to, to teach them how to uh, uh, get connected to the soil because we're all connected to the soil whether we realize it or not. And it's a very powerful thing for these young people. And one of the things that we did was uh, through this hands-on education is these kids um, uh, had problems with uh, reading and writing and, we, and it really improved their uh, um, uh, education by uh, being uh, in a hands-on way to use their hands and then they would be more uh, inspired to dig deeper and want to know more and their grades improved and something we're using in the Milwaukee school system today. You can keep going. Uh, and I also work with the juvenile justice system. Uh, some of these kids had done some pretty awful stuff and we would put compost uh, by their facility and they would uh, start giving back to the community by selling some of their produce and giving away some of their produce. And then we would decorate communities and uh, crime would be reduced because people would start paying attention to things in their community and the uh, criminals would go away. Uh, a lot of the break-ins would stop. And this would produce jobs for some of these young people in the summertime. We'd take vacant lots where gang uh, leaders would hang out and drug dealers and uh, I call these flower explosions back in those days. And, um, we would take a vacant lot one day and turn it into something like this. And our kids would take care of it. And then we'd have uh, 
uh, folks from out of town, from native villages and from Inglewood where there was a murder a day. And in 1995, the Journal Sentinel wrote a front page story about me working and doing this work and it kind of exploded into uh, what it is today. So this uh, takes us into the turn of the century and uh, growing power really starts growing in terms of what we do and uh, you can keep rolling. Uh, this is how the facility looks today. Uh, next. Uh, we're powered by a lot of solar, uh, a lot of renewable energy systems. Uh, solar cell panels. Uh, we also have solar hot water system that we put in this year. We also have anaerobic digester to take uh, solid uh, food waste and turn it into acetic acid. Uh, we're one of the only multicultural, multi-generational organizations that's led by a person of color. So uh, our whole thing is about multiculturalism and the power of that. And uh, if you come to our place, you'll see that within our staff. We have 50 uh, employees now. And these are faces of some of the people that come to our workshops. We do workshops from January through uh, June. Um, and folks come in from all over the world to learn in a hands-on way of how to grow year-round, how to be able to grow this good food that is really the most important thing in our lives is food and, and, uh, and water, of course, too. But uh, it's the thing that really helps build communities and we can't have sustainable communities without a strong uh, food system in our communities. Keep going. And it's all about local food. Developing this local food system uh, that's real, that's an, an inspiration to people that want to go out and start their own food system. And of course, composting is a, a very important piece to be able to take the waste and, from these guys who think they're green and they uh, you know, operate these big trucks that rumble through our, uh, so we're in competition with them to get that waste. Uh, this year we'll do 22 million pounds of food waste and, and part of that is developing the relationships with the folks that have the waste. Keep going. Brewery waste, uh, wood chip, uh, moldy hay from some of our farmers, uh, fruits and vegetables that come actually from California that never get out of boxes. Keep going. And then we uh, compost, uh, this is right in the city. We did over a million pounds uh, uh, each year in the city. Uh, now we have uh, a large composting operation uh, working with the Metropolitan Sewage District at their uh, sewage treatment plant. They have over a 200 acre facility. And then we teach folks how to do uh, composting. <laughs> and this is kind of an approved bin around the uh, nation. And then we have this finished product about eight, eight months later that uh, we grow um, our food in because our, all of our soil in the, in the cities or rural areas and suburban areas is contaminated. So we have to grow, uh, grow new soil. So that's the reason that uh, we're doing uh, so much soil in Milwaukee and other places around the country at our regional training centers around the country. And once we have that, then we can do vermicomposting uh, and create worm castings, which is the best organic fertilizer. Uh, and we do this uh, year round. And it's a, 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 these worms are uh, another aspect of our, uh, uh, some, more, some more employees that we have, you know. <laughs> So instead of having 50 employees, we have uh, millions of employees. You know. <laughs> and they break down the compost into, uh, like I said before, uh, vermicompost or worm castings. And people, have, people, and especially kids, get very connected uh, to, uh, it's one way of engaging them. It's that moment of engagement. And even guys like that, you know, are into it, you know, so. You thought I was kidding when I said I had 600 slides. <laughs> but I wanted to give you a taste of uh, what we do. Uh, and we do this on a daily basis, 365 days of the year. Um, uh, we grow, uh, we turn it into uh, uh, compost tea as well. We do it throughout the winter. Uh, we also do aquaponics. We have these aquaponics systems, if you want to stop there for a second. Uh, these systems um, are 10,000 gallon systems. They're not heated by um, uh, hot water, solar hot water. 
uh, we get the uh, our glycol up to 300 degrees and uh, it goes into a heat exchanger and we pump water out of the out of the systems into the heat exchanger so we save about 70 percent of our fossil fuel fuel use by using uh, uh, those solar panels next and these systems uh, cost a fraction of what uh, uh, con commercial systems cost. We uh, are using the plants as a way of getting rid of the nitrogen. Here our staff is putting in 10,000 uh, fish into a 10,000 gallon system. And what we're using is vertical farming within uh, these greenhouse structures uh, where we raise tilapia and lake perch, which is mercury contaminated in the Great Lakes now. And uh, there's a moratorium on uh, actually commercially fishing for lake perch, which is Wisconsinites, one of the favorite fish. Okay, how's the time? A couple more minutes. Here. Okay, keep rolling. We're also growing our own food using black soldier fly larvae. Um, in the wintertime, we use uh, compost to heat the greenhouses, so we're able to uh, bank uh, compost around the outside of the greenhouses to keep them warm because that's where the cold air enters the greenhouse and we're able to grow food throughout the winter inside in uh, the harshest of, of climates in Wisconsin. Uh, we're able to do that because we need this good food not just uh, for a short uh, 20 weeks of the year, but the entire uh, uh, season. And we're able to grow intensively outside. We're growing at about $5 a square foot, which equates to about $200,000 an acre. Uh, which is much more than the conventional farmers are getting. But it's all about the soil. If you remember anything I tell you tonight, it's all about the soil uh, to be able to grow this uh, healthy food. Okay, keep going. Again, we're using vertical space. We're taking uh, 5,000 square feet. We're now growing mushrooms uh, as well. And uh, we do these workshops, and people really learn in a hands-on way, and they can take that back to their communities and make it culturally appropriate. But all of these products are, uh, we're able to, we figured out how to get the same food to everybody in our community, regardless of the economic situation in the community. So that's, that's one of the things that a lot of people uh, have struggled to do over the years, but we figured out how to do it. And we, everything that we do, we're passing on. Uh, we're also doing uh, anaerobic digestion, taking uh, uh, solid food waste, grinding it into a slurry, sucking it into this big tank, creating acetic acid, changing the, uh, the uh, microbiological structure of that and putting it in a, a methane digester, producing methane. Uh, scrub it clean and create electricity uh, as another form of our uh, system. Keep going. Looks almost good enough to eat. <laughs> and then we uh, built this solar system over the winter. We have some pretty accomplished, uh, and this is our new hot uh, solar hot water system that we just installed. Uh, this system, again, will provide 70% of our and then we also uh, do water catchment. Uh, we capture all the water off of all of our A-frame greenhouses, and then we uh, uh, circulate that water back into a fish system inside. Um, and that's been, uh, almost everything we do that we design uh, has multiple uses. As a matter of fact, our water that's heated in the greenhouse is our primary heating source. We also have animals, um, on the farm in the city. We have 39 goats and 700 chickens now and uh, turkeys. So it uh, provides an opportunity for the school kids. We're heavily involved in providing food for Milwaukee public schools and we're a tourist destination for over 15,000 people a year and many of those are uh, students who get an opportunity. Uh, we also do bees and teach beekeeping at our facility to youth as well as folks that come in from around the country. We have a commercial urban ag training program. We train over a thousand farmers a year now. And these are some of our projects. Uh, we work with the, uh, the blind. Uh, we also uh, work with the Catholic charities and immigrant farmers and we grow on top of asphalt and concrete. Uh, these farmers, these folks wanted to farm instead of play cards so we put in the garden. We work with corporations and put in gardens at corporations um, and they become 
uh, some of our, and we became the fourth city in the nation to have a garden at City Hall. We put that in um, at City Hall. And we work with the other corporate. We, have, we also have a music, we have a aquaponic system at a museum. We also have we farm at a cemetery. All cemeteries used to have greenhouses, so why not? Every space that we can find in the city. So we resurrected these greenhouses that weren't used for five years, and now we're growing food and keeping people out of that uh, uh, cemetery for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're uh, putting a, a new store. This is our new composting facility at the Metropolitan Sewage District. The, this is a large, we have four acres of lagoons there that we put into uh, action now and we're cleaning our first compost out of there. Next. And across the street we have 30 acre, a new 30 acre farm where we're building, uh, putting in hoop houses. Next. And we're uh, building a green, uh, this is our, um, a student project at a school, it's a two year project. Uh, we're building a green garage totally off the grid with students, all, all uh, uh, renewable materials. And this is a new project in Madison. We're, we're building a community center, a charter school, uh, greenhouses, it's going to be agriculture, charter school. We work with the Boys and Girls Club with the compost and you can put a garden anywhere. So this is a park. Now these students now, these young people now have a garden. And we signed a 20 year lease for a five acre with the Milwaukee public school system and a very challenging community. And these folks are able, about five weeks later, they're able to um, harvest greens. One minute, okay, keep going. We're getting there. Uh, these are some of the youth that we work with. And they have to do everything we do, so they learn how to do just about everything that we do. This is uh, historic Grant Park. We have four farms in Chicago. We have a new seven acre farm that we're gonna um, be uh, constructing uh, on an industrial site. Uh, this is Cabrini Green, where we haul down a thousand, uh, a hundred thousand pounds of compost, and on top of this is grown on top of asphalt. This is the seventh year. Uh, it's uh, funded by the Fourth Presbyterian Church in downtown Chicago, and residents from the Cabrini Green, which is probably the most famous housing project in America. Uh, we also have a, a, a farm in Jackson Park now in Chicago. And downtown Chicago, lot, uh, I forget the name of it. This was our first project, and it was an art project. And kids used the art. Uh, and we also bring our compost to schools in Chicago and start gardens at schools like you do here in California on top of asphalt. And seniors' backyards, uh, there's a senior farmer's market of 30 farmers. Keep going. I think that's it. Or no, there's no. more. Uh, we're at the <laughs> Chicago Flower and, Flower and Garden Show uh, this year, and this was our display at the Chicago Flower and Garden Show. Next. These are some of the youth in Chicago. If they weren't doing this, they might be doing something a little, a little worse. So uh, next. Mm -hmm. Keep going. It's just a few more. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, I will stop there because I'm out of town. But that uh, out of time. But then, uh, our future uh, uh, is to continue to build our infrastructure. We have 15 farms and uh, to train people around the country and bring uh, people to the table, bring everybody to the table to work together. I think that's the uh, what I want to put. And you know, and then I'm working on a succession plan as we're going to build a five-story vertical farm uh, at our site in Milwaukee. And I think that's the future, especially in cities like San Francisco, if we don't have a large land mass to be able to go up because more people are moving into cities and we gotta figure out how to feed them good food and not just a certain segment of our population, but everybody. So that's what I think a lot of us that have been in this business uh, for many years are, are starting to do, but I think we need everybody. I think it's everybody's responsibility because 
everybody wants to live in sustainable communities and we can't if we have a segment of our community that uh, live in these areas that uh, have no access to food and uh, and like uh, my colleague here was saying with the water uh, water issues in the country uh, we have to solve these problems and the only way we're going to solve them is working together so that's where I really am going to put my energy in the rest of the time that I have uh, on earth to make sure that that, that we and, and you know that really uh, I think What's really inspired me more in the last uh, couple of years is the fact that more young people are joining, uh, you know, this work. Uh, I think uh, over 60% of the people now that are doing uh, this uh, food system work are under 40 years old. And that's a big change from when it was 20 years ago. Uh, so, uh, and as I go around the country and speak at universities, young people want to do this work. So they want jobs, and, we ha and I feel we have to create this industry uh, to have these jobs, and, and I see that happening. And people of color have joined uh, what I call a good food revolution. I know Michael probably doesn't agree with it, but I think it's a revolution. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that man's a genius. <laughs> a little daunting. <laughs> my, friend, my friend Majora Carter, uh, who got the MacArthur Award, called me a few months after. She said, why does everybody hate me? I said, well, I hate you. <laughs> you know, you got all that money. They call you a genius. So, I, you know, no, I don't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's really, uh, it's incredible. And, uh, and I, I hope that um, what I say can, can, t can connect to what both of our Predecessor said, Jahan and I used to work together, and um, and I think I'm going to kind of give, like, in some sense, an odd mirror image to what she talked about um, a little bit. So the last time I was in this room, I gave the commencement speech for the Energy and Resources Group, uh, which was really great. And I was running a nonprofit called Redefining Progress, and I decided I had to inspire everybody, which I generally you should probably do at a commencement. But you know, uh, but it was a time also where um, it felt like it was my job. First of all, for speaking of identities, um, I ran a nonprofit profit, um, a sustainability nonprofit, as I used to say, in the country that had the most profligate use of fossil fuels, the highest incarceration rate, and was at war. It was as far from sustainability as you could possibly be. Um, and so inspiration was a big part of the job. Um, and, um, and I think that uh, I think that's hard, and in my job today, uh, I, I inspire people today in my job too, if I'm lucky. I go in and I get the sales guys in my company. I, I now work at a company. She, my real title is the Chief Green Officer at Hurrah, which is a, a software enterprise environmental energy management software company in Silicon Valley. And, um, and if I'm doing my job well, and the salespeople sometimes think I do, I inspire people to buy our product. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, and mostly, but I actually do more, I think I do more than that. I inspire them to be greedy. So like my secret ingredient is to, um, not my secret, it's not that secret, but you know, I always figured, even when I was running Redefining Progress, Jahan probably even heard me say this, I, I didn't figure people would do environmental stuff to like save money and to be nice, and, but how could we make them more money um, by, if they did something green? And so in some sense, and I haven't quite figured this out, I'm kind of a beginner at business, but um, because there's some people who do a great job of inspiring business, business people broadly in big audiences, and I'm not sure that I'm there at all yet. But, um, but my job is, a lot of what I do is thinking about how do I get people hungry for money? Uh, um, and not just to buy our product, but that our product could help them make more money. And you know, you could say it differently, they, they're hungry to serve, hungry to be a better company, hungry to, but at the end of the day, their job is really to deliver all this money to people who own them, um, and, and to sell a lot of it, what they sell, and hopefully what they sell is useful or good. Um, but even if it isn't, it'd be better if it was greener, right? Uh, so um, so I'm, I feel like I'm lucky at one level because I'm kind of getting to sell something, sell something green and be in business, which I'd never been in before, and still sort of hold on to what I believe in. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm sort of, as an identity issue, thinking about, okay, how do I inspire? What, what, what am I doing here with respect to inspiration? Uh, particularly being here today, the last time I spoke here, uh, and things like that. And I guess I would say, um, 
And then the other thing is the time isn't that inspiring when it comes to climate change, right? I mean, when I was here in 2005, I was like, I, you know, I don't, I don't, maybe a little before that, 2004, I don't remember what year it was, but AB32 I don't think had even been introduced yet, or maybe it had, no, it hadn't been introduced yet. It was three months before it was introduced. So there wasn't really, Bush had just been reelected. You know, like, you had to inspire people. Like, you had to incite resistance and, and warfare against the status quo to get the idea going. And then, we, so we went through the eye of the needle. We got in California the great climate law, uh, which is under threat. Make sure you vote, get your friends to vote. No on Prop 23. Um, but, um, and, and then, you know, and then we have an amazing president, and we still have what I believe to be the most powerful team for clean energy this country will ever see running the country, right? From, mostly from Berkeley, of course. John Holdren, Steve Chu, um, a, a whole host of people in the White House who you don't know, but maybe the Carol Browner you know, but really, really smart people. A, a polluter's worst nightmare. Um, and the president, who on May 15th, um, got up at Carnegie Mellon University and said that, that the oil spill was about our economic future, not about pelicans, right? That it was about the, our economic future. Um, and that, it, and, and maybe hasn't been able to, and it gave his only Oval Office speech about it, right? Um, so we're never gonna get a better team in power. We might get more power before they get in power or while they're in power, but we're never gonna get a better set of individuals in power. But through all that, it's like kinda hard to sit here and go rah, rah. Right? Uh, first of all, the guy's the president, and most, these days most people aren't feeling like he's that inspirational, although I still consider him ins very inspirational. Um, so we're in a, in a different time, and it's almost like, def like the time for inspiration has passed, at least temporarily. Uh, and you know, Gore would say it's the time for consequence. What I was thinking was it's sort of the time for commitment. And not just political commitment like buckle down, which I hate. I can't stand it when we talk about how hard it's going to be to make this change, all that stuff. That I think is pretty useless. But commitment in the kind that Will is talking about, right? Like putting you know, compost on asphalt, um, building farms, changing systems um, deeply. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Right? It's about you know, a stimulus package that may take a few more years to actually save a lot of energy, but hopefully will. It's a time of almost. Um, not to be environmentally violent, but of, of construction in some sense, of committing to projects, of committing to real work. By the way, one of the features of our software is you can move from plan to commitment. It's really cool. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so um, and anyway, so that and 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 this and and I think a second thing is we're facing what I call my number one management tip in all climate work is and keep this in mind if you're doing the work. All climate work is messianic work. Everybody doing it is, in fact, saving the whole planet. And what that means, if you're doing the work and managing people who are doing the work and working with people who are doing the work or selling to clients who want to do the work, is they come to you with incredible motivation and energy for the hope that this work represents. And they will inevitably also be nailed to the cross on a regular basis. Um, they will be disappointed deeply disappointed in how far their ideas have gotten and where they've gone. And we're, again, from an inspiration perspective, not exactly, it's not necessarily the moment, it's the moment maybe to reflect on, on our, um, our fall and our lack of popularity, not our messianic qualities. Um, so inspiration is a, is, a, is, is a theme that comes to me in this, in this moment and its role. Um, I want to talk about identity and talk about two paths of identity that, just two stories about identity that, um, that, that I think about a fair amount. I was, I was lucky enough to go to Copenhagen last year without anything to do really at all. I just got invited, I had a hotel room, a friend of mine put me up and I got to watch for once instead of doing all these other handling weird things I have to do when I go to, well, you know like the way I throw in the Jewish identity there? Um, uh, when, I, when, I go to, um, when I go to these events and What's, and I left there with an, I thought it was a striking event and truly transformative in ways that uh, a lot of people don't agree with. But, um, and for me, the image I left there with, and I, I excuse me for those of you who are deeply involved in this issue otherwise, is the idea of uh, domestic violence. And the image I had was that the world today is about, it has two, two spouses in it. One whose hand is around the other's throat and is choking the life out of them. Um, the big emitters in this country are the equivalent of a domestic partner, a violent domestic partner. And what, what that person needs to do, what needs to happen is they need to leave the room. They need to take their hands off the victim's neck and walk away. And go to another room, shut the door. And I've been in an environmental, another thing that happened when I was there was that I saw a 12-year-old Danish girl getting off the 
train with her parents with a giant climate justice sign. And Jihan, the team and I we used to work with Jihan, had the first climate justice meeting ever in, at one of the cops in yeah. 1995. Actually, before that, Ancha did one in <laughs> The Hague in 98 or 2000, maybe. But, um, but I, I'm conflicted about justice and climate, because I think climate change is all about justice. But the moment to discuss justice is not, the one, is not when the hands are around the neck. The first thing to do is walk to the other room. And from a practical political perspective, um, the, non, the, the low emitting nations have no control over the violent actions of the emitting nations. None. They have no leverage. They have no power. The people's hands are around their neck. Okay? They have no power over that. We, the chokers, have to get our hands off the neck and walk away. And that's our job. We have to do that. Second of all, from a justice perspective, we, they have no course for redress at this moment in time. We are broke. We're the abusive spouse that is broke. We're not gonna, we don't, we, you don't have any control over how much money we can give you because we don't have any. So you're not gonna get any more money than what I, the abusive spouse, decides to give you. Right? It's a very scary image. It's violent because that's what's happening. It is very violent what we're doing to the world. Um, and, and yet it says, well, how do you bring in concerns about justice given that all of climate change, from my perspective at least, is a justice issue? What does it mean? Does it mean that the abused spouse goes off and starts thinking about the custody battle because there will be one for all those climate refugees? Um, or, or what? What do you do? It's a question we have to ask ourselves. Second one, I think, and this is one I think I talked about when I was here last time, is I think there's a deep identity divide in the sustainability movement between people who think that what's wrong is that we're going to break the planet and people who think what's wrong is that we're going to break our spirits. Um, and it's a very unacknowledged one. It's one that especially in a haven of environmental expertise I try to harp on a lot because I think it's one we don't talk about enough. It's the difference between our identity as animals, right? I need a place to drink water and that's warm enough for me to sleep or cool enough for me to not die of dehydration. And our identities as eternal souls, as people whose job it is to make the world right, to, to help suffering, to be empathetic, to join with other souls in creating a better world. And when you think about what could happen to the world environmentally, maybe we'll break something. Maybe the, the atmosphere will evaporate and we'll become <coughs> Mars or Venus. It'll stick around and get really hot. Or maybe it won't. Um, one of my favorite papers on this is the, on the carrying capacity of the Earth as a trillion people. I do think the Earth could carry a trillion people. I really do. I'm an environmental scientist. I think we could. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but when we do, and on the way to carrying as many people as we do, and it's not the number of people, it's the way we carry them. The untold suffering involved in the kind of world that we're headed towards, not because the environment's getting worse, but because of how we have to treat each other to run the world this fast and this hard. Uh, and so what Will is talking about is so vital because it's about bringing back into these industrial entities that are part of destroying the world. It's about figuring out how to humanize them and create that soul identity in our own communities again in an industrial era. How much time do I have? One minute, ouch, okay. So, um, so I think that it's important to realize that we all have shifting identities and we have incredible examples of them in this room at the table. Um, obviously, Will, who you know, has had a long career before he did this, started as a farmer, became a corporate guy, went back to being a farmer. Jahan, who is a bilingual person in the way that, that um, trilingual actually probably, in the way that people of color and indigenous people have to be in understanding and holding the tensions and the different identities that, that are required in the modern world. One of my great heroes here is Bob Epstein, who is somebody who constantly has reinvented himself from being a software guy to being a clean tech guy to being a political guy. Um, to, in the effort to make this change happen. Um, and, and I think the issue of shifting identities and owning all of our identities and being willing to use the ones we need to create the planet and the community we want to, we want to be. So in some sense, what will it take to win in this moment of low inspiration maybe is it will take greed. Um, and it'll take all, because it's a part of our identity at the end of the day. And it'll take all the other identities we bring to this struggle. A hundred years ago, for example, to give you a sense of, that, of the com commerce of identity, the average American family spent none of their income on education, I'm sorry, none of their income on transportation, and 2% of their income on education. Today, the average low-income American spends half their income on childcare and transportation. 
They work half their lives to, drive, to park their children someplace they are not and drive away from them to work. Now think of all the identities, and that's just 100 years. That happened in 100 years, right? I, call, I, I look at it, think of it often as share of wallet because I have this other company that's consumer focused called Cooler, check it out. Um, but uh, <laughs> but, um, but it's you know, the share of wallet, right? Half of your livelihood is now taken by this other set of products because that's a form of consumption. You're a consumer of a certain amount of gasoline, of a car, of a house in the suburbs. You're a parent who's parked your char child far away. You're a worker who has to reach certain locations to live, to make a livelihood, and to live the kind of life you want to live. Identity is through all of this, and is through all these changes we have to go to. And last but not least, I've been touched, as I'm sure some of you have in the last couple of weeks, with a wonderful piece about identity that's circulating on the web. I think it's called it's get, It Gets Better. Has anyone been looking at that? Yeah. Right, an effort to fight the anti-gay, uh, the, the suicide rate, a lot of suicides and, and gay bashing happening like right now in America uh, at this very moment. And they're testimonials by people who have survived brushes with suicide because of harassment around there. Very personal testimonials that are circulating on the web. And they, look, they, they tell you their story and they look at you. And there's sometimes, some of them are really weird and conservative Republicans and all kinds of people. And they look straight in the camera and tell you it, it gets better. And I think at a time when inspiration isn't there, it's important to keep envisaging that form of inspiration that has to do with commitment, with staying alive, and continuing to commit until it gets better. Thanks. I'm just like real content to let them all keep talking. So I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna ask you a question now. Control the situation a little bit. I guess I should get up. Just like, get up. All right. So uh, we had students and faculty gave a lot of questions, and because I like to be in control, I, I had to choose the one that I wanted to ask first. And I kind of changed my mind a little bit as I was listening to each of you speak because I wanted to uh, wanted it to relate a bit. I like this idea of shifting identities. Uh, one of the questions that I was given is do you think that the growing policy and political focus on climate change has helped or hindered your work? Now, I'm gonna say that again, but I think before you can answer that question, I think I, we need to ask you, but first, how do you define climate change? And let me give you some context, because it's so funny, we use all these words and we think we're all on the same page, and I, I'm thinking, not at all, and I bet if we went around this room, everybody would have something different to say what that is. Climate scientist Mike Hume has said, quote, rather than placing ourselves in a fight against climate change, we need a more constructive and imaginative engagement with the idea of climate change. He talks about the idea of climate change being both a physical phenomena that can be measured and quantified and a social phenomena, and as he puts it, quote, depending on who one is and where one stands, the idea of climate change carries quite different meanings and seems to imply quite different courses of action. And where one stands reveals not just how someone understands the larger scientific narrative about climate change, but also reveals one's attitudes about risk, technology, well-being, um, our different ethical, political, and ideological beliefs, and our different interpretations of the past and our different visions for the future. And Michael, you, you touched on some of that at the end. So two-part question. First, how do you define climate change? And then do you think that the growing policy and political focus on climate change has helped or hindered your work? <laughs> I'm a climate, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, for me, I'll answer part of the question. For me, obviously, uh, you know, my thing is a very proactive kind of approach. Uh, it, it also um, involves economics, too, uh, for our organization to be able to uh, reduce our fossil fuel use, uh, which also helps with climate change, you know, in terms of uh, uh, being able to use renewable energy, our, our next uh, vertical uh, the vertical farm that we're going to build uh, uh, will hopefully hopefully be off off totally off the grid using geothermal and uh, kind of a, a, a diverse mix of renewable energy. So uh, I think my work is uh, to try to inspire people being located where we are uh, uh, and having that many visitors and that much attention now. I feel a responsibility to uh, uh, create this example of how you do it, 
because you can sit around and talk about this stuff forever, but you know, to, to really have uh, this model uh, on Silver Spring Drive where thousands of cars drive by and they see those solar panels, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I know our energy company uh, is very happy that we're able to, to put the funding together to be able to do that, you know, so. So that's one way, be very proactive and create examples, especially in communities uh, that are under stress, communities that have been, you know, decimated by many things and uh, where there are a lot of uh, environmental issues and so forth. So, uh, so I think that can be an inspiration to, to different folks. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of like a climate welfare baby. I, I, I make money off the issue, so. But I, I think um, <laughs> I define it. I, I define it as a econom I define it economically first and foremost. Really, I do think that um, from a number of perspectives, um, to think of it as uh, an environmental issue. Uh, First and foremost, it just, you're not engaging with the right part of the challenge. The challenge is an economic one. It has implications for things like your soul and for the planet. Um, but um, at the end of the day, you know, one of the things I'm, I've been saying recently is um, you break it, you own it, right? To recall a bad analogy about the war. We are trying to change the whole way the American economy works and much of the world economy by getting rid of fossil fuels or getting off of fossil fuels. And so the, really the focus has to be on not breaking that economy while you do it um, in some key ways and making sure the transitions happen correctly. Plus, the economy's already quite broken um, and it's very hard to get people to focus on things that aren't about that and frankly then, you know, the broader, longer term narrative in many ways, the president is again very good at talking about this, although he doesn't demonized Reagan as much as I would. Uh, you know, we made a choice to become a, a banking country in the 80s. Uh, you know, and I do work on supply chains. I'm stunned at how many of the companies we work with are buying their products in Japan and Germany. Uh, and the rest of the industrialized world chose to go into high-tech manufacturing. Well, we use more energy than anyone else. We need a lot of high-tech manufacturing to do it better. Let's make that transition so we can have a more diverse economy again. So in many perspectives, I, I, I see it. And then the fight is about economic power. Right at the end of the day, it's it's about that. Um, something I didn't say. Sorry I'll, to talk too much, but I do think there's a dialectic between policy and um, business. Right? We're, we just have to sell those commuters something different. <coughs> Staying at home, working closer to home, different kind of housing, different kind of vehicles, etc. Um, and there's a huge economic battle underway to shift that spend away from all the things. By the way, food is six percent cheaper. The, the amount of income spent on food went from 15% to 9% in that 100 year period, probably as a result of fossil fuel subsidies as well, I guess. So, I mean, it's an economic battle uh, on many fronts, and focusing on that piece is, I think, the, from my perspective. And I don't, I, I think this issue of is it taking the place of other issues is a, it's a, uh, so uh, is a, it's not really that relevant. If you want to work on other issues, work on other issues. That's fine. But everyone kind of knows that 70 to 80 percent, especially in this room, the 70 to 80 percent of all environmental problems are caused by energy. And if we can get rid of the worst and dirtiest energy, we'll solve more of the environmental problems, all the other environmental problems, than anything else we could do combined. So go for it, solidarity. But if you want to keep talking about toxics, which is great, do it. Uh, absolutely, no, no problems with that. Michael, Michael, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a good question because in the beginning I'm like, what do you mean what is climate change? It's obvious what climate change is, but as we're going, I guess personally the way that I look at the issue of climate change is that it's, um, uh, I don't want to say uh, spiritual, but kind of like a much deeper it's a much deeper issue for people, like about people's way of life. Um, because I think what's emerged out of climate negotiations and climate policy is, is you know, a possible, you know, trillion dollar new market in the world. It's about commodifying air in addition to commodifying land and water in the world, you know. It's um, about deciding that a tree's only uh, use and only value has to do with how much carbon it brings in, you know? So it is like a very important kind of, um, we can put a stamp of approval on this direction of our society, our global society, or we can't. And I feel, I mean, the way that I think about it is, it's kind of like, 
a battle between good and evil, not to sound like <laughs> really crazy, but I do think of it that. I think we're like at a really important place where we have to make a direction if we're going to keep on doing this kind of uh, greediness, everything's about money, the only value that things have is about money, you know, preserving traditional knowledge, preserving languages, preserving cultures is only valuable if you add money to it. That's the direction that climate change is putting us in now, you know, and we can say yes to that or we can say no to that. And that's the way that I think about it. Your second question of has um, recent focus on climate change helped or hindered my work, I think it's helped. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm a person who works much, I don't work with um, businesses, you know, a lot of times I work much more with local communities and grassroots people and social movements and this and that. And uh, I've definitely seen, especially in the past year, how many more people are taking on this issue as part of their work on militarization, as part of their work on immigration, as part of their work on food sovereignty and women's rights and all these kind Business. of... And, and business has always been there, obviously. <laughs> a lot more people have taken on this issue and seeing this issue of climate change. And so I think it's connecting people in a way that I haven't seen before. And in that way, my work has been much easier because you know we, the solidarity thing is growing. Um, that's it. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, but there are, I'm, I'm amazed at how inspired, you know, it's all messianic work. I mean, all the people I work with are so, so believe in what they're doing, uh, and there some of them are like real sharks, you know. That's but true. they really yeah, believe in true. it. They really believe in what they're trying to do. That's right. Yeah. So. It's a personal like a, a. It is like even I guess for what he's saying, like people really take it on as something that they really feel important about. Makes it to me some sort of I don't spiritual is not the right, right word. Someone else can probably think of a better word, but it is something very important in terms of a person's own values. And I think that's important. Thank you. I'm trying to decide, you know, I'm looking at you, I'm listening, <laughs> and I can't decide whether to ask this question. Um, <laughs> okay, because, you know, those of you who know me know I'm going to, I have to, if I don't ask it later, I'm going to be like, I can't believe I didn't ask it. <laughs> so, because you've all, to, to some degree, referred to shifting identities. Um, Jihan, you've, you started off with the story of the place where you grew up and the experience largely collectively of the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to say it. Yeah. So, <laughs> Do you feel that your ethnic or racial identity has implicitly or explicitly played a role in how you do your work? what you choose to focus on, and how you per are perceived in the spaces, communities, groups, circles that you're invited to to have this conversation about climate change. Um, if you, so uh, do you think it implicitly or explicitly plays a role in how you do your work and what you choose to focus on? Do you think there are certain expectations because of what you look like and who you are in a room? Are there people you're expected to represent? And you can take that however you want to and talk about that. So, um, you know, I'm I'm in a complicated place on that issue right now. I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, the uh, the I mean, I I grew up like when I was five years old. Like I knew I wanted to work for social justice, and I've not changed my career choice once ever. Like it's like a total life lifelong commitment for me, and that definitely comes from my background, my, both my parents were refugees to this country and in various ways, and I grew up in New York City at a very tough time when there was a lot of social, a lot of difficulty, direct, you know, murders and drugs from social injustice in my community. And that's always been a motivator for me. At the same time, um, I um, am less perceived as a black person than I was when I was younger, because I'm bald and older and I have a PhD. And you know, it's like, you know, now I get in taxis in New York and they're like, where are you from? I said, oh. and, you know, and, and you know, literally, you know, you know mer like, in, like on, on Dolores Street, Marines stop me and ask me if I'm like at the cafe at that hour because I'm breaking Ramadan. I'm like, no. 
you know? And they're like reminiscing, like they want to meet an Afghani. They like they because they miss it somehow, which is pretty cool too. It's like weird. So um, I'm 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 uh, you know, but I and I also and it's a age thing. Those of you who are, are until 1965, until like the 60s, like one drop was enough to get you lynched. Everyone was looking like you black, you black, oh, get the oh, kill that boy, right? And then it changed. It started to change. America's creolizing, right? Where in fact lightness of skin and class achievement. Right, um, uh, is is uh, helps you pull up. That was true. That's true in the rest of the America. By the way, that's not a better situation, but it's the way it is in the rest of the Americas. They're creolized societies. America was a very not a creolized society. It is becoming one. O.J. Simpson, Charles Lindbergh, same deal, right? So I mean, these are the, you know the, the meaning a rich person of color can potentially get away with a big crime just like a rich white person can, um, and and so these are these are all. Parts of our story of changing identity, and I, and I was, I was born in a time when there was no qu question that I was black, and now people want to classify me as biracial, mm -hmm. right? So this, it's pretty interesting. Now, what it has, I really, I don't, I mean, it has a lot. My my deeper motivation comes from definitely my ethnic and, and racial background. Um, I'm still figuring out how it plays on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in America today, which is a, a more more complicated and or different place than when I was growing up. Not necessarily better, different. Hmm. I'm trying to think of which story to tell. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, a lot of times I get the question of how did I end up doing this kind of work? Yeah. And I can't pinpoint anything in particular, you know? I can't say, oh, well, you know, I came to this realization when I went to college or when I first saw the coal mining or, you know, I can't pinpoint anything like that. And eventually I just started to say, well, it's in my blood. <laughs> and I think that that is true, you know, and, and I feel like uh, definitely m my work is affected by where I grew up and my culture and that the values that you're supposed to have, honestly. And I think for me, it gives me a, a real, um, a sense of, well, I know who I am, and I know what's right, and so I know that I'm doing the right thing. And I think which is very important, something that um, I notice that a lot of people don't have that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I do, I mean, I'm half black and half Navajo. I do look black. I feel like I have then been put in a situation where I'm responsible for bridging different kind of communities, which I don't think is a negative thing at all. And I think it's actually a, a strength of mine. Um, because, you know, there is all this internalized oppression and, you know, things even in between that I've witnessed in between, you know, uh, Hispanic communities, black communities, native communities, Asian communities, like our own internal trying to figure out how to deal with each other type of thing. And um, being, you know, biracial or whatever, I feel like it's just put me in a position and a lot of people look at me to kind of figure, help to figure that out. And I think that in terms of our work, like as environmental justice or social justice um, movements or whatever you want to call him, that, that that thing hasn't really been addressed in a, a um, proactive and intentional way. And I think that that's something that's really missing um, from a lot of these different kinds of movements, that that's kind of something that people want to ignore and forget about. And once we do actually work through all of this kind of stuff, like what does it mean, you know, what is the role, what should we get back as indigenous peoples, original people of this land, what should African American people get back as another segment of society that helped create the richness of this country, you know, like once we work out all those issues, I think we'll be a lot stronger. And I feel like um, to some extent, I'm, I am in a res uh, responsible to some extent for helping to, to do that kind of work. Uh, I guess I could talk about this forever. I, I kind of <laughs> grew up in, uh, uh, around segregation in terms of, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I grew up uh, right outside of Washington, D.C. on the border of Bethesda and Rockville, Maryland, where it was, you know, I, I, I was really exposed to uh, diversity, but at the same time, I went to segregated uh, um, grade school 
uh, till I was uh, in sixth grade when in Maryland schools were uh, desegregated. Uh, so I was the first a lot of times to go to uh, an all-white school. Um, and then my parents never really talked negatively, even though my father was a sharecropper and left the South, South Carolina. Uh, you know, and had been treated very badly by white folks. Uh, but he never talked negatively about anybody, n nor did my mother. So I grew up in a situation where um, I believe that uh, everybody should be equal and, and, uh, and it's something I worked, worked on all my life. And uh, being the first African-American athlete uh, at the University of Miami, uh, was challenging, as any black person in, in this room will tell you, every day of our lives are challenging. I mean, when I leave home every day, I go through about four different zones to get to growing power, where I have to uh, think that maybe I'll get stopped because of the color of my skin even today. Uh, so it's, it's a lifelong struggle, but at the same time, it can, you know, I've, I've decided a long time ago I'm not going to let that stop me from doing what I have to do because I believe in multiculturalism and, uh, and I've, seen, uh, I've seen a change happen, especially in our work around this food system work. Uh, years ago when I would address a crowd like this, I would probably not find a person of color uh, in the crowd 15 years ago. But today, as I go around the country, I've seen that change. I've seen a big change, and uh, you can even just look at this panel, you know. Uh, uh, I didn't know who was going to be on the panel, you know, but you know, <laughs> this wouldn't have happened 15, 20 years ago. So uh, we do see some change, and, and as people of color, we feel it every day. Uh, I remember getting letters from the Klan when I went to University of Miami. And as I write, I'm writing a book right now, and I was telling, <coughs> I was telling Charles Wilson the other day, I wish I would have held on to some of those letters, because they, they were pretty interesting. <laughs> 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 but uh, again, I've always been the kind of person that I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing what I think is right. And, and the work that I do, like I said, I really <coughs> promote multiculturalism every day, because it has such power. Uh, to live in a diverse, uh, and have diversity around me is such a powerful thing and gives me a lot of strength and drive to do an inspiration to have different people uh, uh, in an organization in my life and, uh, and my family's that, that way too. My uh, grandfather was uh, Cherokee. Uh, so most, most people of color are mixed. Uh, and we're, ta we're, ha we're actually having this conversation, I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday about uh, skin color and being an athlete. Uh, being an athlete has really helped me in terms of having access to a lot of things. And we were talking about Michael Jordan being as dark as he is and how popular he is. And people forget about his skin color, but in some areas, uh, if, a, if a person of his skin, skin color would apply for a job, they would never, that application would go in the wastebasket. So uh, being an athlete has really put him in a position to be able to, to uh, do what he's been able to do. And it, it, it has also helped me in terms of uh, having access to people that I would never have access to, uh, you know, especially in the business world. Thank you. And because we, we, we've been running behind, but I want people, I have a thousand more questions, but I'd rather open it up and give you all a chance to ask questions. Wow, that person was really fast. <laughs> <laughs> <That> was <laughs> uh, hi there. Um, my question uh, to um, our growing power friend here. Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, business models and not um, so much the, the uh, clean tech um, venture capitalist business models, but uh, perhaps your um, insights into the kind of grassroots economic organizing that you've done. Uh, what kind of revenue mo model do you have? What kind of revenue streams do you have? Do you see the non-profit vehicle being the way forward? Or should people be thinking about worker cooperatives or cooperative models? 
Well, I, I started uh, uh, growing power. When I started it, nobody would, uh, and my friends talked me into, I don't come from a nonprofit background. And when I started working with youth and I was volunteering, volunteering my friends said, well, why don't you start, you like this work, why don't you start a nonprofit organization? I said, I don't know anything about it. You know, I'm not a grant writer, I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, well, well, we'll write grants, we'll be your first board and, and so forth and do the administrative part because they know I, I'm a farmer, I wanted to uh, keep my hands in the soil and work with the kids and so forth. So um, I, I, when we started going out to look for funding, and we're talking, you know, almost 18 years ago. Nobody would fund us, you know. And there's another, uh, there's another reason for that. Only 4% of all foundation funding actually goes to people of color-led organizations. So we're really at a disadvantage from the beginning. But uh, what, what helped me was the fact that I come from a for-profit background, and I said, well, we just sell products and services, and that's what we that's what we do today. About 50% of our income of our $4 million budget comes from selling products and services. So uh, I think that's a more sustainable. Uh, I've seen many nonprofits go out of business recently because they don't have income streams. They don't operate as uh, business folks. So what we've tried to do is quantify all of the different systems that we have into uh, separate business systems uh, so that it's part of our uh, ability to work with folks that want to, uh, we really have to do this. Many people want to uh, do this type of farming, but they, they, we have to prove that you can make a living at doing it, that you can cash flow a business. So each one of the over 30 business models we have, uh, we have to quantify those, and we're uh, continually working on that and evaluating uh, to the point that we've hired an internal evaluator, that's all that person does is evaluate our programs. And, and uh, uh, we work with universities to help us in terms of quantifying a lot of things that we do and measuring things that we do. <laughs> yeah, this is a question for Jihan. Uh, I was at the U.S. Social Forum, and I know the Indigenous Environmental Network I know the Indigenous Environmental Network was uh, very much involved in putting on the People's Movement Assembly for Ecological Justice, and I just wanted to hear you explain that for the crowd and tell, the, tell us how that figures into your, your thinking and where you think ecological justice as a concept will go. Man, I need my laptop. No. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's hard not to talk straight into the mic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, I don't know how many people here went to the U.S. Social Forum. Okay. And so how many people here know about the Social Forum process? Okay. So kind of the goals of this is to bring together, well, in the U.S., it's really to try and create a larger social movement in the U.S. Um, that's you know uh, focused in just the justice aspect of things and part of that process it started with world social forums they have regional social forums around the globe and this is the second u.s social forum that happened in detroit this past june um, the pma process the people's movement assembly process was to create um, well, it was to, to get work done, basically, because a lot of times these are big gatherings where people come and network and meet people, but in terms of moving forward after the social forum with a, um, with a, a segment of the movement-wide plan for action going forward um, hadn't really existed, um, and that's what the People's Movement Assembly process was. So everybody at the social forum who was involved in you know, energy issues, climate, environmental issues um, came together uh, and created a plan of action. So we put forward, we left that social movement or the movement assembly with um, a specific plan of action around, um, you know, the BP oil spill, um, the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, um, and just kind of like priorities and key moments that are coming up for this kind of movement that everybody could get around and do something with. And that was the point of that. Um, 
also what came out of that is like a core set of, it was like, I think they called it a manifesto, but a core set of principles um, for moving forward. And I think that it's a really strong thing. Um, that, that movement assembly, I think, was really strong because it was led by affected communities, people of color and indigenous communities. Whereas, you know, a lot of times in the US, um, in the environmental segment of the world is not that diverse, right? The environmental world here in the US. So I think that that was very important because it didn't exclude, it wasn't only people of color and indigenous communities, it was also kind of like irregular enviros who were there as well. Um, but I feel like the affected communities really were able to take the lead in the direction of that movement moving forward. And I think that that was the first kind of very explicit moment where that happened, where we set it up, we made the process successful and came out with this very good, um, very good plan of action. And these other people, um, individuals and or other nonprofit environmental organizations were okay with following in that process as well. It wasn't a contentious thing. People were not arguing. It was all, we were all on the same page and I think it was really successful. And in moving forward, we've um, started to create another network called Climate Justice Now North America here in the US, who's using that as a platform for moving forward um, and to have a cohesive movement around energy, climate, and environment here in the US that's led by uh, people who are most affected. So it's great. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, you had your hand up. Uh, for Will Allen. Hello. <clears throat> for Will Allen. Uh, I'm really impressed by the project that you've done and all those pictures there showing the technologies that you've done. I'm really impressed. And I want to do that in my city. But the biggest challenge that I see is getting land use. So I could, was wondering if you could recommend how to get uh, the use of land. Do, do I look for you know, five-year leases? Do I look to government entities? Uh, what's a way in, in a, say, the, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, how to get little plots of land or, or a couple of bigger plots of lands. Um, I, and as, as a little story, I, I know someone that's trying to get five, year, five acres of BART track right away that's not being used. But he's been talking to city governments. He's been talking to people. And it's just it's been a long time. And there's no end in sight as to when he's actually going to get use of, of property that's just sitting vacant right now. So your suggestions, please, on how to get some land to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I, I can tell you how we did it. And again, uh, you know, this work really takes a lot of patience. You know, it's funny how quickly years go by. Uh, but it's about for us. It's been building relationships um, over a period of time. Uh, I was able to buy that farm, so we had a permanent uh, base, a permanent site, a concrete uh, site to bring some of the policy makers uh, to show them what, we're, what we do. And I think that was a big, a big piece. And uh, we got quite a bit of publicity because we were the only ones that were doing this kind of work in Milwaukee. So that helped. And uh, you know, trying to leverage the strengths of the people that I was working with and leveraging, figuring out my strengths, with, which is uh, you know, uh, being able to develop those relationships uh, with people and in all sectors, I think, has helped us in terms of now with the medical community uh, in Milwaukee getting very involved. Uh, uh, all the politicos in our state have been to our facility. Uh, they're in, they're, uh, they love what we do. Uh, you know, to be able to get free land, uh, a lot of the land that we use, uh, we pay a dollar a year for. That uh, shot that I showed you with the sewage district uh, we have a five-year uh, lease with them, uh, you know, with the, uh, with I know the possibility of getting uh, a longer-term lease in the future, but uh, with the school board, we have a 20-year lease. That one uh, shot I showed you, a maple tree school for five-acre uh, farm at a school. Uh, we have a 20-year lease on that property. so. Uh, it's really about building those relationships. Uh, there's land available, pockets of land. I know San Francisco's a little different. You don't have as much land, open land mass as we do in, in the Midwest and in industrial cities. But 
uh, there's still land in New York City. Uh, I once spoke before a thousand farmers in New York City, uh, but they have these small little plots that uh, that they grow on. And uh, we're going to be doing a project uh, with Chase Bank on Governor's Island uh, that's funded by Chase Bank with some other uh, folks in New York. So there's land available, and there's so many vacant buildings today. Uh, we're growing inside vacant buildings or in aquaponics inside vacant buildings. There's several farms in Milwaukee uh, that, you, that came that we trained that have developed uh, farms. Uh, so. Uh, you know, it's really about building, a, I would say, build relationships with folks. Uh, uh, churches own uh, a lot of land in Chicago, so we've been able to work with churches and use some of their church land. But schools, there are a lot of vacant mm -hmm. uh, schools. Uh, we've closed a lot of schools in our inner cities, and that's, that's land. There's park land. Uh, you know, many, many of the governments today uh, can't afford to maintain golf courses uh, we have a possibility of picking up several golf courses to grow, yeah. to put orchards on. Uh, so you really have to open up your mind and really look at your city and see what's out there because there's a, there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there and everything, like I said, cemeteries. Imagine growing food at, at a cemetery greenhouse, you know. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you just have to be creative. And uh, all the asphalt. I imagine if you're able to grow compost, if you ever divert, divert uh, waste, uh, we're doing 22 million pounds of food waste into compost this year, uh, to be able to grow on top of asphalt and concrete. And, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you talk about climate change, that's going to uh, affect, uh, affect the climate, climate change in itself by that type of uh, approach. We have time for just one more question. Your hand, it's you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hi, I, uh, my name is Seth, and I really enjoyed um, this panel. And I, uh, I wanted to ask, um, climate change is a, it's a local issue, and I see a spectrum. It's a, it's a local and a global and an international and a many different scaled issue. I see sort of a spectrum of places that you all have worked and places where you sit. And I was wondering, um, I guess this is a, a full panel question if we have time, um, how each of you sort of, if you are working more on, the, on a regional or on a, on a national scale, how you're scaling down to the local. And if you're working on a more local level, um, how you anticipate scaling up to a, to a bigger, broader scale. Oh. First, um. So uh, we are, are the company I work for uh, right now is deployed in our software is deployed in 90 countries, uh, and we have uh, upward, up, moving upwards of a half million buildings and facilities in those countries that are being um, monitored and optimized for natural resource use. And um, but I was just walking today with one of my staff people, who's one of our teammates, who is going to. Uh, uh, Middle Eastern country um, fairly soon to work there for 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 them and um, talking about the localization of energy benchmarks right that, that actually there's a lot of culture involved in benchmarking a building for its performance and to know whether your building is high performing or low performing is actually very culturally specific so for example in the United States well in Japan or Europe a lot of the benchmarks are very specific very detailed because everyone who does a benchmark went to the same school so you can afford to get very 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 specific, because they all know how to do the same thing. In the United States, every Joe and, and Jane in the world is benchmarking buildings, and so it tends to be simpler. Not as in-depth, but much more scaled. We have far more buildings, automated computerized systems to do it. It's not super great shape, but it's, it's much more um, scalable. Um, so you've got to ask yourself, so in all, these, in all this work, you have to say, okay, where am I going, right? And, and then there are different types of buildings in different places, right? So it, is, it, is, it has an implication, even if you're at the, at operating at a global level, you have to think about the local and community level. Um, and that's always the most effective way to scale, uh, is, to think, is to make it be as indigenous as possible. To the and as, as culturally and, and community relevant as possible, which I think people do forget, particularly in globally scaled businesses. Um, but it's uh, one of the secret weapons I carry from having done 20 years of EJ work. 
<clears throat> well, I think our organization is a, is a national, it's a national network, or I, in the US and Canada, a North American network. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, my friend Ben sitting there from Canada, and he's like, don't forget Canada. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I think, but we support grassroots communities, like the communities who are on the front lines fighting coal mining on our reservation, doing these water rights fights, the tar sands issue in Alaska, the expansion of offshore oil. So these are all the communities that we support. They look to us to kind of have that national and international uh, view, you know, bird's eye view for them, um, so that they understand how these national policies will affect them, you know, positively or negatively. Um, so, you know, we're from a foundation that we always have to work, uh, work from our grassroots level. At the same time, we also do a lot of work on it, especially around climate change, on the international policy of things. And, you know, our community members, we take delegations there so that they can participate and understand what's going on. You know, a lot of times they'll be like, I don't care about that, like, nothing happens at the UN, they're all just people talking, like, the real fight is here at home, which is, which is true. At the same time, I always tell them, you know, we go to these big meetings, not, I mean, at least for me personally, I go to these meetings not in the hope that I'm gonna like change the entire UN system to do something really positive and create this giant perfect international policy, but we really go there to stop a lot of the really bad policies that are gonna trickle down and definitely affect indigenous people's rights to land, water, indigenous people's sovereignty all over the world. Um, so I, it, it is important to have both of those perspectives and so we do have to, you know, to some extent convince our community members like this is important, but once you bring them there on a delegation, they understand right away um, what's going on. And it's also really empowering and important for them too to meet other indigenous people from Peru, from South America, from Africa, from Asia, who are really basically fighting the same battle as well. Um, and so in that way that the, the grassroots people are really empowered to stay connected um, to what's happening on the, the larger level of things. Um, and so our role is always to be that kind of like connector, bringing people back and forth. So that's how we do it. I would say a lot of people look at our organization as a national, international organization that started out really local. but. Basically, uh, when I started uh, developing this work, I never wanted to go into anybody's community and set up shop. And to this day, we don't. We just, uh, we have these regional training centers around, around the U.S. now uh, with organizations that we've gotten to know through our trainings. And uh, we have about 12 of them uh, throughout the U.S. And basically, they're just training centers. And we help them build their infrastructure, and uh, and they take some of the things that they've they've learned from us and make them culturally appropriate for their community because that's the way it should be. Uh, we shouldn't be going into communities and imposing our will on anybody and saying our growing power model is the right model because there's a lot of models of agriculture uh, that people are doing around the country. Uh, so that's how we operate. Uh, we get invited into communities, and, and, that, and, and I think that's the, the, the way that it'll always be as long as I'm around running the organization. And, and that's comfortable for me, because that's what I believe in, and uh, our board believes in, and you know, they kind of follow whatever I, whatever I say anyway. So. <laughs> But anyway, uh, but I think that's what's right. This work is really about social justice, you know, and that's what, uh, that's what we're all about, is social justice, food justice, environmental justice, you know, all those justices, you know. Uh, that's what this work is about. But it's not about going in and telling communities uh, and gleaning money out of communities and leaving nothing behind. So. Uh, it's important for those communities to be involved from the very, very beginning. Every project that we have, if the people in the community are not involved, I don't want anything to do with it mm -hmm. because they have to be involved and that's part of social justice, not to go into communities and say, I think this is the best thing for your community because it's not going to sustain itself. So I think we've had some success operating that way and uh, we'll continue to operate that way. Uh, I'm not 
you know, people can call us whatever they want to call us, you know. It's, it's all, for me, it's all about the work that we do, the principles that we have. So, we're each going to get like 30 seconds, but what I want to do is uh, just throw back, because you have all said some really wonderful things, and first of all, just to say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I just want to throw back just some phrases I heard you all say, and if you could think of one thing you want to leave us with, and I mean like couple of words. Uh, resilience, not being, not being rewarded for resilience. Engaging the community takes a long time. Focus on multicultural, multi-generational. What gets discarded is used. It's all about the soil, growing the food, growing the communities. Building a succession plan. Bring everyone to the table. Good food revolution. Inspiration. Commitment. Break the planet or break our spirits. Shift an identity and it gets better. <laughs> Last words. The word. <laughs> I think you already said it. <laughs> I guess the last thing that I would say is uh, I'm, I'm not, I feel really excited about this time that we live in and I actually have a very optimistic outlook on this time that we live in. Um, and I think, you know, it can be depressing, you know, <laughs> uh, especially, it's funny because a lot of people, I think the people who come from like, uh, really communities that are poor and, you know, have a lot of negative aspects to them are actually like the funniest, you know, <laughs> the most resilient, like they still have a positive outlook on life, you know? And a lot of times people are like, how can you even smile? And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> the world is good. And I mean, uh, you know, I think it is. And, and I feel like all of these things, you know, climate change just being one of this part that's really pushing all of us and the global society to, um, to change in a big way is a good thing because I think that that means that we have the potential to really improve things a lot. Um, and so it, it makes me happy. And, and I hope that all of you here don't get stuck in the negative way of thinking, um, you know, because this, this whole time is about opportunity. And so I want to make sure that everyone here leaves thinking that way. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just throw it to him. I mean, there's a great uh, Joni Mitchell song. She says, uh, what is it? Um, pave over paradise and call it a parking lot, yeah. right? So we're, you know, un underneath and on top of every par parking lot is a paradise. <laughs> you know, I hate to keep using the word, am I too close? Uh, inspiration, but, you know, I know we probably overused it a little bit tonight, <laughs> but I don't think so. Um, you know, everybody needs to be inspired when I work with uh, young people, I've seen it happen. I've been doing this a long time, so I've seen uh, what happens when you inspire uh, a young person who's struggling uh, and how their life changes. And I think we all, everybody in this room needs uh, inspiration, needs a push to be able to go out and continue and get energized uh, to go out and do what we do every day. I think that's 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 part of who we are as human beings, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for inspiration. And, you know, as I travel around the country, I have this great opportunity and responsibility to go out and speak to groups like this. And I always feel a responsibility to try to inspire somebody to, to, to change their life or make it better or whatever. So that, to me, that's what it's all about, inspiration. When, I, when I'm in the presence of, like, Michael, uh, uh, you know, I get inspired just listening to him or reading his books or whatever. I need that kind of, we need that energy. And when I'm around young kids and when I'm around these folks tonight uh, and I'm a moderator, I feel inspired, and, uh, you know, to go back. And I know it kind of reinforces uh, the work that I do and saying, yeah, I know why I do this work. And I think we all need that. You know, so. Thank you. Thank you.